27 years after, the 1918 armistice is again honored throughout the British Commonwealth. In London, capital of empire, veterans of World War II wear the poppy in memory of countrymen and comrades who also fought for justice and freedom on battlefields throughout the world. On the grounds of historic Westminster Abbey are consecrated plots. Here, crosses are planted in memory of servicemen who lost their lives in this war and in the last. Different sections of ground are dedicated to various branches of the service, to empire and allied forces. Loving hands plant the tiny symbols of eternal remembrance. At Headley, Surrey, members of the Canadian branch of the British Legion hold a service. A typical bit of old England, the parish church, looks down on the younger generation of service people as they revere the memory of their fathers. A detachment from the CWAC lay a wreath on the last war cenotaph. The memorial in London's Whitehall is the scene of the Empire's chief ceremony. His Majesty the King, surrounded by his subjects, solemnly pays tribute to the man who passed on the torch of freedom to a new generation who gallantly bore it through mud and blood to peace and victory. calls for the silence of remembrance. November the 11th, 1918, was a dedicatory challenge to future endeavor. It remained so, an echoing command from silent battlefields of another war. We will remember. Squamalt, B.C., His Majesty's Canadian ship, Prince Robert, is greeted by cheering crowds. Formerly one of British Columbia's luxury cruise ships, she donned the war paint early in the campaign. Now an anti-aircraft cruiser, she has written a brilliant page of history on the high seas. With her 429 officers and crew are repats from Jap prison camps, including 15 Montreal missionaries released by the Russians from Manchuria. The Prince Robert captured a German merchantman shortly after being commissioned. She saw service in the Mediterranean and was the first ship of the British task force to enter Hong Kong to receive the Japanese surrender. Now the ship and her commander, Captain Wallace Creary, RCN, will be content to settle down to the tasks of peace. Ship and crew have lived up to the best traditions of Canada's senior service and so we salute the returned veteran, HMCS Prince Robert. At the Hotel Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, delegates from 30 nations register for the Food and Agriculture Conference. From the four corners of the earth, from China to Liberia, they arrive to tackle the great problem of the world's food supply. Welcoming them is the Honorable Ernest Bertrand, Canada's Postmaster General. His speech of greeting received response from delegates of each of the nations. Australia is the first to sign the FAO Constitution, which formally brings the organization into being. The representatives of the other nations sign in alphabetical order. By unanimous vote of all delegates, the chairman of the Interim Commission is elected chairman of the FAO Conference. 
He is the Honorable Mike Pearson, Canadian Ambassador to Washington. Mr. Pearson explains the aims of the organization. More than 30 of the United Nations from all the continents of the world are gathered here in Quebec to establish the first permanent United Nations organization in the field of food and agriculture. Our job is an important one. It is not, however, concerned with the immediate relief problem which is being dealt with by UNRWA and other organizations. Our work is a long-term proposition to bring into relation agricultural production, distribution, and consumption. And we hope that as a result of our work at Quebec, an important step will be taken on the long road which will eventually lead to freedom from want of food. To Biggin Hill Airport in the United Kingdom comes a group of Canadian servicemen, all set for a happy holiday in gay Paris. Taking off on a Dakota flown by RCAF personnel, they are off on their cross-channel hop to the French capital. Touching down at Le Bourget Airfield, they are met by auxiliary services personnel and taken by bus to their billets. As there is so much to see in Paris, special tours are arranged. The Canada Club in the Palais d'Orsay is the initial stop. It is the jumping off point for all activity. The Church of Sacre Coeur is the first place visited. Built in the Romanesque style between 1875 and 1914, it gives thanks to God for the departure of the Prussians after the War of 1870. From its lofty altitude, the whole of Paris is spread out like a map. In the Montmartre section of old Paris, artists from form part of the interesting scene in the Bohemian Quarter. In the center of the city, the Paris Opera House is visited while obliging gendarmes give you the answers to anything you want to know. The Cathedral of Notre Dame is a must-see in any guidebook. A section of the Republican Guard show the way to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, where burns the eternal flame. Canadian troops from Holland, Germany and the UK are taking advantage of the opportunity to be included in the quarter of troops who are able to spend a happy Paris furlough. In Kingston and Montreal, the intercollegiate football season opens after wartime suspension since 1939. In Richardson Stadium, Kingston, Queens get plenty of support from their routers as they kick off to the University of Toronto. The tricolor team wears the striped jerseys while Toronto players wear the white crash helmets. The game is pretty evenly divided in the first quarter, with Queens trying several spectacular end runs. of the blue and white score heavily in the third quarter with forward passes and open play, but Queens comes right back at them and rolls up the points. The heavy-hitting Queens squad are just too much beat for Toronto. Sensational 95-yard run from a touchdown by Parry of Queens ends the game with the final score, Queens 19, Toronto 15. Meanwhile, in Molson Stadium, Montreal, the McGill Band and a battery of cheerleaders hail the second seasonal opening between McGill and Western University. McGill kicks off to Western, who are wearing the white sweaters. Early in the game, they score a touchdown and convert on a blocked kick. Then Western gets to work. The Montreal tilt is certainly aerial total war. under the Montreal squad, the Western U boys give their supporters something to dance about as they pile up a score of 20 to McGill's 7 in the opening game of Canadian intercollegiate football. 